you for the name of this man. How many of you would not know his name, right? A face that became synonymous with evil um, to the point where even that odd little mustache is reminiscent of him, right? But if I asked you for his name, would you know it? I'll give you three seconds. Many of us don't know his name and there's a reason for that. When you kill 10 million Africans, you aren't called Hitler. What you're looking at right here is a man looking at the hand and foot of his five-year-old. He was not able to meet his rubber quota for the day. And so the practice, um, many people got their hands cut off. I, can't, I don't even know how to say that nicely. Many people got their hands chopped off. Um, he actually lost his daughter, right? So they unalived her, unalived his wife, ate both of them, and then gave him this um, as a reminder to meet his quota. Here is a picture of two men holding hands. Um, they are holding the hands of people, uh, they were their neighbors basically, because they were forced to chop them off. Evil and torture, uh, white supremacy, colonization knows no bounds. Um, imagine being forced to cut off the hand of your neighbor. Um, it got to the point where the quota was so high, right? And villagers knew that they could not meet that. So they would attack people in other villages to chop off their hands and give it to the soldiers to say, please don't kill us. They started, uh, soldiers started taking hands to their heads of states and it became a game almost. You know how people go hunting and they save the head and put it up on their wall? They would chop off the hands and deliver them to them. How long were we told that there was nothing in Africa? Think about it, when you're a kid um, and you don't finish your food, what do they say? There's starving kids in Africa, finish your food, right? Um, we're told this land is just devoid of civilization, there's nothing there, the people are savages, right? How is that possible if that's where civilization began? And I don't know about y'all, but I've never seen someone break into a house that's devoid of value. Why would you break in? And a, a country's most uh, valuable resource is its people. Africa as a continent, its most valuable resource, even though it has many, is its people. And I think it's a testament to us that we're still here. Shalom. Call Laimla. Evil. Call Laimla. Yahweh. Bahashim. Yahweh Shai. Bahashim. Rakakadash. All praises be to the most high Yahweh in the name of his son and our Lord and Savior Yahweh Shai much respect and honor to the brothers that are doing the work in truth and sincerity risking their lives and freedom to do so and pushing this gospel throughout the four corners of the earth salutations to the hopeful elect that is scattered abroad and double honor and respect to the elders and the apostles of Great Millstone. Coming back at you with another lesson entitled The Fierce Hand of the Lord. Usually what we talk about is the hand of the wicked. And quite often we have a lot of fear and reverence for the wicked. And usually the acts and the deeds of the wicked mass over what the right hand is capable of. Many people don't know that the right hand is more fierce than the left hand of the Lord. Why you think Joshua hung the opposing kings and before hanging them, put his foot on their necks? So let's see if we can find that. And by the way, there was trillions of gold recently found in the Congo and an estimate of about $12 trillion of gold found in the Uganda, country of Uganda. Let's go here. I think it's Joshua chapter 10. <coughs> Joshua 10, the five kings of the Amorites. Let's read this. Joshua 10, verse 4. Come up unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of of Hebron, the king of Yarmouth, 
and the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up. They, <coughs> excuse me, gathered themselves together and went up. They and all their hosts and encamped, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gigal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. Let's see what happened to these kings. Get to the key point. Right here. Joshua 10, verse 20. Let's go to verse 19. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them, and smite the hindmost, every last one of them, from the head to the tail. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them, and suffer them not to enter into their cities. For the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand. And it came to pass, when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter, till they were consumed, that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. So this is what the Most High is going to raise up at the destruction of this kingdom of Edom. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 that there is no new thing under the sun, and what has been shall be again. So the mighty men of David are going to be raised up with supernatural abilities. And that's going to come at the standard of fire being lifted up. The chariots of the Lord are going to take up the mighty men of the house of David that are going to be changed. <clears throat> read verse 21. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. None move his tongue against any of the children of Israel. It's going to go back to that. Right now, the so-called Negroes, Native Americans and Latinos are the most disrespected people on earth, at least here in America. Nigger, ape, spick, sambo, jigaboo, three-fifths of a man, you name it. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua in Makeda in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jermoth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings that and they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them and this is going to happen again the current kings of the earth are the international bankers and joshua said unto them fear not nor be dismayed be strong and of good courage for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward, Joshua smote them and slew them 
and hang them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the caves wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. So, really, the right hand is going to be feared on the earth again, which starts with the great right arm of the Most High, which is Yahushua. So the right hand of righteousness is going to be lifted up on this earth again. And really, we're seeing early signs of that happening right now with the Israelites prophesying, standing up with great boldness in the face of those that have afflicted us. So the right hand is going to be a terror on the earth. Let's go here to Isaiah. Isaiah 19, the book of Isaiah, chapter 19, let's go to verse 16. In that day shall Egypt be light unto women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. So the men of Israel are doing that right now, bringing Reproof, bringing rebuke until the daughter of Babylon, unto the kings of the earth. The Bible says that this truth shall reach the gates of the nobles, pursuant to Isaiah 13 and 1. Let's go to verse 17. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. <clears throat> so what is the counsel of the Lord? His ministers, his prophets, his men. So Judah is a terror unto the land now just by speaking the words of the Lord, prophesying, but that power is going to grow. The Most High is going to turn up the heat through the Spirit. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts which he hath determined against it. Let's keep it moving. So, the Bible says, what thou, what thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee, and thy reward shall return upon thine own head. And that's going to be done through the right hand of the Lord, a terror unto the land. So this King Leopold, Look, in around 1916, the Belgians, they colonized the Congo and they murdered upwards of 15 million people in the Congo. And they also went into Rwanda. That's why those tribal frictions and divisions that they created in the Rwanda from the Belgian colonization, it created long-lasting contention between the Tutsi tribe, which was the minority that the Belgians raised up and empowered them to be the governing authority. So the Tutsi people were oppressing the majority Hutu people of Rwanda. So eventually the uh, Hutus got tired of it. And in 1994, there was a great genocide in Rwanda, which upwards of 800,000 Tutsi 
tribal people or tribesmen were murdered. But again, the roots go back to colonization from the Edomites. Then you have here King Leopold, 15 million people estimated to have been massacred underneath King Leopold, and if I'm not mistaken, yeah, King Leopold II, and it's not showing it here, but 1885. Notice here it says how Belgium, Belgians cut off the hands and arms of the local people there in the Congo. So we're going to find out that the right hand is more fierce. Let's go here first. Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 10. Let's go up. Ishabeth being murdered. The son of the son of um, Jonathan and the grandson of Saul. See, let's read this one. Second Samuel 4, verse 1. When Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was ba Baana, and the name of the other Rechab the sons of Ramon and Berethite, of the children of Benjamin, for Baruch also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Berethites fled to Gitaim and were sojourners there until the day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel and his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Let's see what his name means. Mephibosheth. name means one moment comes from the Hebrew Strong's H 4648 Mephibosheth Mephibosheth second entry Mephibosheth Mephibosheth comes from Mari Baal exterminating the idol Grandson of Saul. Seven victims surrendered by David to the Gibeonites to avert a famine. So his name means exterminating the idol. Okay, let's go back. And the sons of Ramon, the Berethite, Rechab, and Baana went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishabeth, who lay on a bed at noon. So he's lame and he's only five years old. And they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib. And Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and get them away through the plain of the night, chopped off his head. And this is just a kid. And they brought the head of Ishabeth unto David to Hebron and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishobeth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord have avenged my Lord, the king, this day of Saul and of all his seed. And David 
answered, Recall and Ba'ana, his brother, the sons of Ramon, the Bethrathite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity? When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziglag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. So one of the characteristics of King David is a strong loyalty and integrity. Here it is, King Saul tried to kill King David and hated King David. But King Saul had made King David a high-level captain of, of the troops, of the hosts. And King David married King Saul's daughter. So despite all of that, and despite the numerous attempts of King Saul trying to kill King David, King David's integrity and his character was unshakable. Never compromise his loyalty. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed, shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? They're in trouble now. So once again, King David is beloved of the Most High. King David is a man after the heart of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai, after the Lord's own heart. And David commanded the young men, and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishabeth and buried it in the sepulcher in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. <coughs> so they gave Ishabeth a proper burial, but cut off the hands and the feet of the murderers of Ishabeth, the young five year old lame boy. So this is part of the brutality of the right hand of the Lord, which starts with Yahweh Shai, followed by the tabernacle of David, mighty men. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17. Let's go to verse 50, 51. <coughs> Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So Goliath, his head was cut off after he was slew with stones. <coughs> And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sha'a-Raim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. Now, who, why didn't he teach us this coming up in the churches? That the beloved of the Lord was chopping off heads, hands, and feet. Let's read verse 50, 57, 1 Samuel 17, verse 57. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him 
and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. So going back to this picture here. You aren't called Hitler. The Bible says what thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. So there's going to come a point in time where the right hand of the Lord is going to be strengthened and raised up. Matter of fact, let's get this one. Hebrews 10 and 31. Hebrews 10. Let's read verse 30. Let's read verse 30. <coughs> For we know, for we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So this judgment comes from on high. The Bible says that unto the Lord belong the issues from death. That's Psalm 68. Verse 20. Let's read verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So the hand of judgment belongs to the Lord. I'm going to look up that word hand. Let's get it here. Hand. One moment. Hands comes from the Hebrew. Strong's G fifty four ninety five. Higher. Higher. Okay, it says instrument. Power. Upholding, preserving, punishing determining and controlling the destinies of men. It symbolizes power. So the Lord is going to give power to his servants, to the men of Jacob. Well, we can get that. Acts 1 and 8. That power starts with the gift of, of prophecy, excuse me. So that power starts with the gift of interpreting the Holy Scriptures, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's where their power starts. And that seed of truth grows. Acts 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. For that power is promised to the men of Israel that's being, that's on display now prophesying the end, which means to say before, predicting events with pinpoint accuracy, famine, restricted travel, being marked and tagged and bagged, being tracked and monitored, the Mot B, Revelations 13, verse 15 through 18. I mean, we can keep going uproars of the people brother against brother wars rumors of wars we're living in those days now let's read this one second samuel 12 let's go up second samuel 12 verse 26 and Joab fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. So Joab is a top general under King David. 
his right hand man. And Joab fought against Rabah of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. The Ammonites today would be what we call Japanese today, the Ammonites. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabah and have taken the city of waters. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it lest I take the city and it be called after my name. And David gathered all the people together and went to Rabah and fought against it and took it. And he took their king's crown from off his head, the weight whereof was a talent of gold with the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he, let's go to Second Samuel 12 and 31. And he brought forth the people that were therein and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron and made them pass through the brickland and thus did he unto all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. So David put the Ammonites through torture chambers. Let's pull up some images. Harrows of iron, axes of iron, and made them pass through the brickland. This is the closest image that I can find. So this would be spiked with little, it would be threaded with little spikes that the Ammonites had to walk through. And this is the same King David that cut off the hands and feet of the two murderers of Ishabeth. So these are harrows of iron, which are torture devices. Was David a man of the Lord? Had somebody come on the comment board one day and said, uh, you're not a good Christian because you're using, you're using harsh language. The term Christian applies to the Israelites. And it was a labeling term that the Romans used to identify the followers of the Hamashiach, the Anointed One, which is Yahweh Shai, our Lord and Savior. Let's get that. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll go to Acts 13 and 1 first. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Neger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul they were called Neger which means dark skin matter of fact we'll pull it up here Well, these are the true prophets, dark-skinned men, the original prophets. Go to that word, neger, comes from the Greek. Strong's G, 3526, neger, neger. Okay, they're using black, which we means, we know it means dark skin. Check this out. Look at this. A Christian. A Christian. See? Black and a Christian. So the original Christians are the Israelites. 
The true Christians are the Israelites. You're looking right at it. Black Christian. But again, we know dark skin. Now let's go to um, Acts 11 and 26. The book of Acts chapter 11. Verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called Christians so anyway, the purpose of this lesson was just to get some insight onto the fierceness and brutality of the Lord's right hand, which starts with Yahweh Shai. That's why the Bible says, the slain of the Lord shall be many. And Isaiah will close out with that one. <coughs> Let's go ahead and read it. <coughs> Excuse me. Isaiah 66. So the Lord is going to create an all-time high score on bloodshed on the earth. Isaiah 66. The book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. When you read Jeremiah 25, it says that in that day, what day? The day of the Lord. That the slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even unto the other. A lot of killing. So the right hand is brutal. Hopefully this lesson has been edifying. All praises to Yahweh Hashem. Yahweh Shai, Ba'ashim, Rekla Kadash. Double honor and respect to the elders and the apostles of Great Millstone. Kwam Yesharela, and Abad Babao. We got next, Lord willing. Barakatan. Shalom.